Welcome back to another episode of the Mac and Fish Podcast. In our next episode, we speak with Jason Staples of the Unconquered Podcast. Jason will discuss FSU's 2021 recruiting class. Filling in for our host, McKinley Roll, is our good friend once again, Corey Long. Back for another segment of the Mac and Fish Podcast. We have a great guest today, uh, someone that uh, is a very good friend of mine. I've known him for a while. Probably one of the most knowledgeable football fa- friends of mine. I mean, we've had a lot of good arguments. Um, some of them I've won, not many. I, I got to say I've won like maybe two out of every 10. Uh, and I think Jason, who we're going to introduce, Jason Staples, uh, Unconquered Podcast, right? That's what you do, Jason? The Unconquered Podcast? That's among, his, among others, yes, that's he, it. He does his own thing. And what Jason does very well, which I don't know if I could do, is do a show on my own. I'm good at talking with myself, but just I don't know if I could do it recording. But we have Jason Staples on today, and uh, this is going to be a very good podcast, I believe, as Jason's very knowledgeable about the subject. Florida State. And we're going to talk about the 2021 class. How are you doing, Jason? I'm doing pretty well. Just uh, getting to the end of a, a long 2020. There's no doubt. I think I think we've all we've all wished for this uh, 2020 to move on. But um, you know, let's get started on this uh, recruiting class of Florida State. You know, they didn't sign a lot of guys. There's 15 total, but. You know, they had a major need, one at quarterback. Um, They did lose their one high school quarterback, Luke Altmeyer, but they kind of fixed the problem with McKenzie Milton, who had a very good career before a a very serious injury at UCF. Tell us a little bit about, you know, McKenzie, what you know about him and how he'll fit in to the Mike Norvell scheme and what they do. So I I actually got my hands on some some old – some old UCF coaches tape, which has been helpful in in evaluating him. And, uh, and, and there are a few things that stick out about, about Milton from that tape. The question is really going to be how much, how much of that of say 2017 Milton is Florida state going to get? Cause if they're going to get the guy that I'm, I'm looking at on on the tape on 20 in 2017, then you're looking at a guy who's going to be one of the best quarterbacks in the country. The, the realistically though, that's, that's probably not the same guy. I mean, cause UCF did use him as a runner, I think a good bit more than he's going to be able to after that injury. Uh, but what I wanted to look at is, is how does he grade out as a thrower and as a decision maker? Cause that's really what's going to matter for, for Norvell's offense. Uh, and a couple things that I noticed is one is he gets rid of the football really, really quickly. Uh, he, he is very decisive with the football actually uh, shows a lot of one of the first things I look for in a quarterback as a thrower is anticipation. And, and the best way to think about that is think about a quarterback as a, as a point guard, the best point guards are guys that see the, the cutter. They see the open lane. They see where the pass needs to go before it ever happens. And they're already getting rid of the ball before the guy even is, is ready for it. And those guys are the guys that really make plays in basketball as a, you know, those are, those are the distributors, the playmakers that have a natural feel for it. The best quarterbacks also have that kind of knack where they process really quickly and they they're throwing to space rather than throwing to guys. So I know that my guy is going to be breaking there, that that's going to come open based on what I'm seeing the defense, I see this rotation. I know my guy is going to be coming in there. I'm getting rid of it now and throwing it before the guy is, is open. And one of the things that you see with Milton is the ability to throw guys open with anticipation. And that's something Florida state hasn't had in a long time. I mean, you go back the last quality thrower they had was Deandre Francois in, in 2016 and he's a guy that had a howitzer for an arm, but he had no anticipation. He had to wait until a guy was open to be sure and then really stick it in there. Uh, Milton reminds me, actually, as a thrower, there's some similarities to Danny Werfel, in my opinion, uh, in that and, and he moves differently than, than Danny did. He, he moved a lot better than Danny before the injury. But the ability to throw vertical routes with a lot of touch, with a lot of anticipation, he does not have a super strong arm. He's not going to, he's not going to 
throw throw it into into tight windows and all of that with a bunch of uh, of arm strength. But he's a guy that more than compensates with, with uh, from uh, for that with that anticipation, with the ability to get rid of the football quickly and throw with a lot of touch. And those are things that in Norvell's offense, Norvell, the first thing that he's going to be spending time with in any offense in terms of installing is four verts. He wants to, he wants to threaten teams vertically and he demands that his quarterback throw vertical routes with some accuracy. And he wants his guys to be able to win those, what he thinks should be 80, 20 balls, a lot of back shoulder throws, a lot of things like that. And if you can't throw that, that, that ball in Norvell's offense, everything's already off to a bad start. Cause that's just, that's his bread and butter. Milton is going to be one of the best guys in the country at throwing that particular set of routes. And that makes him a good fit for Norvell's offense right there is especially given how Florida state's been where the quarterbacks have had trouble at times, getting rid of the football uh, on time. You get a guy that's going to get rid of it on time and can throw those vertical routes with a lot of accuracy that makes him to me a really good fit for what they need. And then you add the leadership component, which I can't attest to personally, but you know, obviously everybody talks, everybody raves about the guy. So that, that seems to be a really natural fit for them. I add the winning gene to that too. They haven't <laughs> yeah. had a real winner in that roster for a long time. So. Yeah. And a guy that, and a guy that knew how that, that, that worked to become a winner. Yeah. absolutely. Right? Not, not a guy that walks in and believes that he's entitled. They've had a lot of entitlement in that program and in that quarterback room. And this is a guy who is going to walk in and, and he doesn't carry that at all. Well, that's, that's one of the things I'll jump in that I brought up on another podcast is this is the first time, like DeAndre felt he was owed that job. So there wasn't really competition. James Blackman felt like he was owed that job. There really hasn't been competition since, you know, it's been a while in that, in that locker room and, and, whether he wins the job, which I think he will, at least he's going to make the guys in that room better. You know, he's going to make Jordan Travis a better quarterback. He's going to make those young guys better just because they don't know what it's like. You know, he, he's ha- he's gone through all of that at UCF. We talked about it. You want to talk about a guy, they're, they're going to open with Notre Dame. Here's a guy that beat Auburn. He knows what it takes to win a big game. And I think you can't take that away from him. And that, and the guys in that locker room haven't done it before. And, and he's going to be able to walk in and command respect. Yeah. That's the thing. Everybody, every, everybody on that roster knows that UCF has been better than Florida state since he's been, since he made them better than Florida state. Mm-hmm. And all they have to do is flip that tape on and go, okay, this dude's a baller. And so he doesn't have to walk in and say a word and try to earn respect. He's going to be able to get that respect from day one, just by virtue of that guy went undefeated in, in, a, in, in, in the season as a starter. And that's with, with win, with a win over, over Auburn. When, when you're beating Auburn at UCF, you're doing something right as a quarterback. Right. So that's a, that's a big pickup for Florida state. And I think for a lot of reasons, the intangibles, and also again, just in terms of fit, what he brings to the table, I think he fits what Norvell really wants in a quarterback. And that more than anything is a guy that can get rid of it quickly, make really good decisions very quickly in the post snaps situation and throw verticals with a lot of, with a lot of accuracy and give guys a chance. And, uh, and he's a guy, I know fish, you, one of the things that you look for that you always harp on is does a guy when he throws when he when he's throwing a slant or when he's throwing a, a square in these sorts of things, does that guy throw it in such a way that his guys are able to run through it and keep and keep moving? And that's something else that sticks out. Even when he was throwing on the move, he was was consistently leading his receiver with touch so that his receivers were catching the football and not losing speed. Yeah. And I, that, again, that 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 adds yards per per uh, per completion just right there. I mean, that yeah. makes things so easy on receivers. Yeah. I mean, that's the one thing that's been a big knock at Florida state and everybody wants to blame Dugan. Say, I, I remember we had this discussion. They blamed Lawrence Dossie. Now Dugan's is the, you know, the guy they want to pick on how much of the wide receiver play has been poor because of the quarterback play. Like they've got guys probably on the roster that are a lot better than they've shown, but the quarterback play has been so inconsistent that these guys look like they're not really good. A lot of them. What do you think about that? 
Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, there, it's a it's a recursive thing. I mean, these things are symbiotic, right? If you've got great quarterback play, that's going to make your receiver play better. And if you have great receivers, they're going to make the quarterback look better. So it all works together. And, and of course, if you have an offensive line that gives the quarterback tons of time, then that makes the quarterback look. Yeah. So all of this stuff works together. The problem that Florida State's had is that they've not been real good on the offensive line. So they've not protected super well. And, you know, in the last couple of years, I mean, this year they weren't, they weren't great. They were, they were pretty good actually this year, but the prior two years, they were an abomination. So you got bad protection. Then you combine that with poor quarterback play. And then you combine that with average to poor at times receiver play. Well, each one makes each, makes the other worse. Yeah. And so what you've got to do is you've got to, you've got to stop the bleeding so that, it, you know, fix one spot so that the other spot can start to get better. And, and this is something that as a receiver, it does make things so much easier when the quarterback puts the ball in a consistent place. Cause I, I think a lot of people underestimate because people go out and play catch. Well, yeah, you can catch a football, but can you catch a football when you're running full speed and you stop and you turn and a ball's coming at you at 60 miles an hour and it's already on its way. And then, you know, that's hard. Most people are not going to catch that and they're not going to catch it. If it's here, they're gonna break a nose, but then you add to that that it's three feet out of frame and a guy has to reach for it and he has to reach back or he has to go down for it or whatever. That just makes things so hard for a receiver. And even when you get a ball that's on target, when you're used to having to find, find the football rather than it just being on location, then you're going you're gonna to drop more balls. So I do think that's a factor. That said, the receivers haven't done the quarterbacks a whole lot of favors either. I mean, they've been a lot of 50, 50 type balls that really should be 80, 20 balls for receivers and guys just don't fight for the football. They don't, they it, Florida state's been missing some nasty at wide receiver guys that have that chip on their shoulder that say that ball's mine. Yeah. And th th what they've had is they've had a bunch of guys that are like, that, that are stereotypical prima Donna receivers that are saying, yeah, you know, I, I you know, just give me the ball and I'll take off. Well, no, you got it. You you've got to play with that chip on your shoulder. That no, regardless of where you put it, I'm that's mine, and I'm going to prove that I'm the best guy out here. And they haven't had a whole lot of that. Um, and and you know, it doesn't take a guy strutting around for that. It's a matter of the competitiveness. And you can see when these guys go up for the ball at times that that that's the part that's missing. And. and there's nothing you can do. There's, there's not much you can do as a coach to force that on your players. I mean, either they're, you, you know, if they don't bite when they're puppies, they ain't going to bite when they're dogs either. So, you know, you've, you've got to get guys that actually want to compete to be able to do that stuff. Right. Now, I think the first step is, is, is it should be taken care of with, with Milton. You get that taken care of and it will help the receivers. And then we'll see how much is really on them. Okay. All right. Well, we, you know, we, 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 we've talked about the quarterback was obviously the most important position. And uh, I think was, I think this is a crucial pickup for me. I think they needed a quarterback. Like I don't, I'm not, I like Jordan Travis. I think he was by far their best player on offense. I think he's, I think listen, a lot of fans, I think he's greatly underappreciated because I think they probably, they might not have won a game if he didn't exist. They I mean, wouldn't have won a game this year. They, if He didn't play. They very easily could have went 0 and 9 if he didn't play. Um, and I don't, I'm not, you know, I just think the freshmen are, are, are a ways away from being productive players. So they needed somebody right now. And I, I you know, they needed something that could come, somebody that not come to compete, but could just give them a chance to have more, have more productive, more normal quarterback play at the position. If I'm, I mean, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but I, like I said, as much as I like Jordan Travis, and I think he's pretty much responsible for their three victories um, they needed, they needed, a, they needed another quarterback. They needed somebody that could come in and compete right away. Yeah. I, I think, I think that's absolutely right. That, they didn't necessarily need another freshman that need to be developed. They need a guy that could jump in and be part of the mix. Well, the, the, the fact is it, that especially not having had the first year to really get situated recruiting wise in the state of Florida, they know they need to make and they need to have a significant on field visible improvement next year. I mean, when you're a new staff, the new staff smell wears off quickly. You've got to be able to start 
showing recruits and high school coaches and others that this is a place you want to, you want, you want to come, you want to send your guy. And if they don't get improvement, immediate improvement next year, then they know that it's going to be a really tough sledding to get this program turned around. So that's why you've got it. Like you said, you've got to get a guy that can come in and, and contribute right away. And regardless of how good Jordan Travis is, and, and I think you're right. I think he's very underappreciated, especially for what he did this year. And they, it, they might've beaten Duke without him, but they, they're probably one and eight without Jordan Travis. And I'm not sure they beat Duke without him. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think, I think. <laughs> I'm just saying that, that's, so that's, the, that's the only one. That's the only one. There would have been a lot of handoffs in that game. <laughs> like, dude, Rodemaker would have been good at handing the. I wasn't real confident. I was like, man, if Rodemaker would have played another series against Jacksonville State, that game might have been out of hand. No, I agree. Yeah, I mean, and so, so I mean, it's very possible they'd have gone 0 and 9 with him without him. Yeah. The thing is, for one, he was injured half the year. Yeah. So, you know, you that that in itself means you better have another guy that can play. Even well, if Jordan Travis wins the job. Listen, I knew that was going to be a problem running a hundred when there was one game he he ran like 20 times by halftime and he didn't play the second half. I'm like, oh man, this kid ain't gonna make it through the year. They're they're like they're trying to get every ounce of talent. But you know, we 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 talked about this whole quarterback thing. Let's let's get into the class, the 2021 class. And Jason, we've discussed this. One of the things that when I look at a class, we look at, we usually do it in twos, you know, Hey, we're going to look at this year's class and last year's class. But one of the things when we look at a recruiting class, that's so important is balance, you know, and we, you know, we, you have to sign numbers at each position. They got the quarterback uh, with, with McKinsey, but they haven't signed a, a, a running back yet. Um, they're still waiting on Destin Hill, the wide receiver from Louisiana, a major need for them. One of them was defensive end speed rush. You know, they've only, I think had 10 sacks this year, which is just insane at a school at like Florida state. What do you think? You know, I'm, I'm really high on the Patrick Payton kid. I've only watched highlight films of the George Wilson kid. What can those two guys bring to their defense that they don't have right now? Well, I mean, both guys are six, five with, you know, like six, eight plus wingspans and both get off the ball. Well, I mean, both guys run. So, that in itself changes what they can do. I mean, the biggest problem they've had defend. Well, they've had a number of problems defensively this year. <laughs> so it's hard to pick out the biggest one, but one big problem that they've had is that the personnel that they're, that they're putting on the field. It, it, they're, it's kind of a square peg in a lot of areas for what they, what they're trying to do. They don't have a great mix of, of guys and you bring up balance you can have really good players on your roster, but if they don't blend well, you don't, you still don't have a good team. And there are aspects of, the, of this year's defense where a lot of the pieces just didn't fit very well together. And one of the reasons, and, and, and they could have decided to run some different stuff to try to fit those pieces better, which I think hindsight might've been the right thing to do. But one of the problems that they had is they don't have a Fox. They don't have that hybrid kind of, outside linebacker defensive end edge player that you can drop into coverage and and be athletic enough to cover the flat and you know get it get his hand in the in the passing lane for the curl once in a while while also being a big time pass rusher you know at different points so you want to have that ability in in their front they don't have one of those guys on their roster i mean the closest is is amari uh, uh amari and, and and gainer's just too small really for that role both of these guys should be able to grow into that role really well. And that's, it's obvious that that's what they were recruited for is to be that particular player. So that, and, and they don't have a guy that, that can bend the edge that can actually get off the ball quickly, dip his shoulder and get, and, and, and bend under the, 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 uh, the, the offensive tackle and get to the quarterback. They don't have one guy like that on this roster. Uh, again, Gainer, maybe the one guy, but you know, he's more of an out, outside backer in what they're doing. So they needed that desperately. And I really was pretty pessimistic about this class until they picked up Peyton and Wilson. And I think that completely transformed the class in its potential, at least because they, that was the biggest need. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I looked at their class, looked at the rankings. I think they, uh, they're 31 and 24, seven, maybe 38th 
on rivals. I think they were 28th or 29th or something in ESPN. Um, Mm -hmm. That, that, you know, there's some circumstances this year. I'll throw them a few more breaks and say, you know, if most of the time I'm not one for excuses, but the excuses seem pretty legitimate this year. That being said, if we're in the same COVID world a year from now, hopefully we're not, those numbers still ain't going to be acceptable. You ain't gonna you ain't gonna get nowhere with the aggregate of a 33, 34 class and hitting about sixth in the conference. That's just not going to get it done, plain and simple. Am I fair in saying that this was not- you know, we there's some good parts here. We can go through them, Rod or I like Amari on Cooper. There's certainly some players in this I like, but I I'm I'm of the belief that your class is as good as the bottom third. And when I look at the bottom third, I want to look away. Yeah, I, I, I really agree with you by and large. I mean, um, you know, they got some players who should be able to contribute in this. And what they're trying to do on, in this class is get more athletic up front and reset the floor a little bit uh, with guys that they, that they felt would, would be able to grow into the kinds of players that, that, that can contribute at Florida State. But that's the thing is that these are guys that are going to have to grow. And I agree with you that once you get down to the bottom, bottom few guys in this class, I mean, I, I hate to call out names this way, but I mean, I, I think a kid like Jordan Eubanks has a lot to prove that he, is, that he would be a take at Florida State in any other year. Uh, I mean, I just, uh, I, I don't see that he would be a guy that in any, any recent class would be, would be, a, would be a take. And, you know, Kobe Gross going to be interesting with, with him as a, as a tight end, big body, but I mean, he hasn't played a whole lot of football and they're, they're really going out on a limb with that, with that evaluation. They've seen more of him than I have, but there's a lot to be, a lot to be proven there. And, and again, in what, what other year is he going to be in a Florida state class? Yeah. And, I- you know, you start looking down the list and that's, that's part of the concern, but I mean, at least these guys are pretty athletic for the most part. Uh, and so, you know, you hope that they can reset the floor a little bit with guys that are going to work. Yeah. I, you know, I look at the, you know, you talk about the bottom, you know, Corey talked about the bottom third. Rem- I remember the days when they, you know, when they signed Cam Irving, Cam Irving was the 25th rated player out of 25 guys they signed. He ended up in the first round. You know, you look at PJ Williams was one of those guys like Terrence Brooks, like Amari Cooper is probably, you know, you're hoping he's one of the top three guys. You're hoping he's Terrence Brooks, you know, like they're top guys. You're hoping that they over, you know, they do what above what they're able to do. And and we've talked about this a bunch of times. Uh, My, yeah, like you said, the bottom of this class is not very good. And and you just don't want to take too many of those guys because, I looked at their roster today. I think they're going to go in right now. They're sitting at like, if everything stays the same, they're at like 73, 74 scholarships. They still have room for 10 to 15 guys. And where are they going to, where do you think they fill those voids? I know they say grad transfers, but a lot of those kids, they got to still recruit them. I mean, those guys, there's a, if they're good, a lot of schools are going to want those kids. How do they fill out the rest of their roster uh, from, you know, moving forward. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Now I will say, I, I think that, that the staff made the right decision taking this small of a class for exactly the reason that we've been talking about that if they're going to fill this class out with other guys, then you're going to get more guys that bottom third expands. Yeah. <laughs> and the worst thing that you could do is say, well, we need numbers and then fill that, fill those numbers out with more guys that are below that bottom third already. And that, that would have been disastrous. So saying, look, Here's, here's our cutoff line. We're not taking more guys unless they're, you know, unless they're better, but we need some bodies in these spots. So hopefully these guys can develop, but everywhere else we're going to, we're going to keep it small and try to get uh, uh, transfers and such. I mean, chemo obviously is another, another piece that could sign. Uh, If they get him, I think that's a, that's, that's a big contribution. I think he's one of the best players, if not the best player in the class. I really, I really like him. And he was a kid that I was on early. I want to credit Alex Atkins. I think I'm not, I, I'm not sold on this staff as a recruiting staff at all, but I think I, he's got the goods. Yeah, he's good. He, he, and, I think he's got the goods. You know, I think I, he's, I think he's got the goods as a coach all around in terms yeah, of I his agree. contribution in the meeting room. I think he brings the whole package. Yeah. Really his, 
I think he's a future head coach and probably a very successful future head coach. All right. Uh, but, but in any case, you know, you look at chemo, you add another one, they'll probably, you know, they, they, they think they're going to get Destin Hill. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's two more that you add in. Yeah. And then I think from there, I think they're trying to, to get their running backs from the, from the transfer portal. Uh, I think they're, I think they're going to try to pick up maybe one receiver from the transfer portal. They're, they're going to try to get some guys at some of the positions where they know they need immediate help from there. Uh, but like you said, the problem is that you're taking a risk because the, the blue chip guys that are transferring, the, the, the guys that are really good, they're going to places that have a chance to win a championship. So you're, yeah. you're really getting second tier transfers to begin with. I mean, you look at last year and the transfers that they got and, and some of them panned out really well. I think they did a great job of evaluating their transfers from last year. And, you know, they turned out some of the better players on this team, which says a lot about this team. But, you know, you look at uh, at they got the the back from uh, from Texas A&M, whose name is escaping me. All of a sudden, Corbin. Corbin, they got yeah. Corbin and Corbin is a good player, but Corbin was coming off a torn hamstring. Yeah. Right. You know, you, you've got, uh, you know, you get you get a, 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 an offensive lineman from FAU who, you know, is he going to be able to step up and play at the level? And he turns out to be the best lineman on your team. That's great. But I mean, are you going to hit on those guys every time? Is is the guy that tore his hamstring yeah, and, and uh, therefore gonna... is on your level? Is that guy going to translate this next year? That's the real concern. But I think this, this year is going to be a wild year for the portal. There's going to be a ton of kids because of the instant eligibility piece. So, I mean, they're, they're banking on it. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, if you look at their portal takes last year, and they took a lot of kids from the portal last year, you know, we, we speak, you know, Love Taylor obviously worked out. He's coming back in 2021. So that I almost logged that as a recruiting win. At that point, you got the equivalent of a Juco player that worked out for you because he gives you a couple of years. But I mean, you know, you look, some of the guys like Love it worked out. Jerry and Jones got a lot of snaps. Jared Jackson, don't know yet, really. Um, Jordan Wilson got injured. You hope he's going to be okay. Miko Dotson played, but you know, I thought he, Dotson was good when he played, but he got hurt. And yeah, he was hurt. Yeah, that. excuse me. Yeah, he was hurt. Uh, Deontay Williams, I didn't see much of this year. Uh, uh, Cornell no, that Jones one didn't work. Make it to the season. Yeah, and I and I saw I saw Jones actually in some offseason conditioning. Cornell Jones, and when he got on campus, it was pretty obvious that he would not be an upgrade over the linebackers that they had. Yeah. I'll, I'll just I'll just be honest about that. All right, Jason, to close this thing out, a year from now, and you know, Seminole fans aren't used to having a recruiting class where this one was ranked. Where are we a year from now? And where do where does FSU need to be a year from now so we're not having the same conversation the day after signing day? In your opinion, well, first of all, they need to win seven games, six seven games next year. Uh, they need to show enough progress that they can be a 500 or better team against what's going to be a brutal schedule. So they need to show progress on the field. And I think if they show progress on the field, the big thing is that there are, there are, there are about six guys that are really just, I mean, you know, this better than anybody fish. I mean, there's like six guys in, the, in that are slam dunk. They have layup. They have, they have layups next year. I mean, Jul Julian Armella should be a layup. Uh, yeah. and, and he, and he's maybe the best yeah. offensive tackle prospect I mean, Mar- out of the state of Florida. And how long? A long time. Marvin Jones Jr. It should be a layup. Um, you know, they've got, you know, the kid, the Kelly kid, they signed, they got a early commitment from Dillard. Um, this kid's really, he blew, he's, he blew up this year. That goes, I guess, to my question long-term. We didn't get to see, you know, Florida Florida is what it is. They're recruiting in Florida is what it is this year that we're going to deal with. I, as, as I was trying to tell somebody earlier today, I'm still not sure of their plan when it comes to recruiting Florida, you know, because none of, because they didn't bring any coaches that had any Florida ties. I mean, the ones that were here were the ones that were here. They put, you know, all that we'd heard was that they were putting Johnson down in Miami. I can debate the merits of that. I'm not sure if that's the best fit for him. But I live in Tampa Bay. I'm out of Polk County, so those are areas I do. Odell no longer – he did, he got pulled off of Polk County when Willie was there. So Ray Woody so was in the area, which was a bad move, a horrible move. That was move. so bad. But that was, that was just – that was a turf situation. Yeah. And, I, I mean, what happened – and I'm going to explain it. 
they were they were wrongly infatuated with players from Lehman High School who were never going to go to Florida State. Arian, the minute Arian, what was his name? Arian, Arian, whatever his name was, uh, the kid that he transferred from Mulberry to Lakeland. I remember telling Ray Woody he's not going to go to Florida State because Lakeland kids aren't going to go to Florida State right now for whatever <laughs> reason. It just wasn't going to happen, and they wanted, but they were like, "Oh, we got to get kids from Lakeland." Well, they're not going to come there. But you know, and Odell didn't like the coach that handled the recruiting at Lakeland, who was a total jackass, by the way. And Odell was absolutely right to dislike him. Um, and he, uh, you know, they just couldn't get anything done. So now what that did was that put him behind on what's a really good 2022 class in Polk County. Sam McCall, who I think would have been a very interesting prospect for the recruit, they didn't have any work. They, they didn't have anything with him. Uh, you know, he ends up committing to Florida. They're not in the Tampa Bay area right now at all that I can see. Um, and they should own that area. They yeah. should be very good in these areas. Jacksonville, there's no, there's no, there's nothing in any of these areas. If you take away Miami, there's still a lot of this state to recruit. Yep. And there's, I don't know what the plan is. I don't know who's going to be recruiting these areas. I don't know who they're going to put. They can't put Odell and Johnson and Woodson everywhere. Some of these guys that we're not, we're not sure about as recruiters have to go somewhere and get some kids. Yeah, I, I I agree with that, and and that's part of the hard thing about the the COVID situation this year is that we didn't get to see these coaches on the on the trail, uh, you know, going out and actually beating the bushes and seeing where the guys were going, and and hearing from from coaches who they visited and saying, ah, this guy, I don't really I don't really buy what he's selling, which you know we're gonna have to start seeing that at some point. I mean, thing is with the with with COVID and all this, it's probably not going to change until maybe what midsummer. I mean, they're yeah, not going to be out. They're not going to be out in the spring. Group this year. I think the dead period is already in what to like tax day. Yeah. I'd be surprised if we got summer camps yeah. this year. Uh, really? Yeah. I think the thing they have to do, and I spoke to a coach today that has a couple kids locally that he has FSU caliber kids. They got to offer kids now early mm -hmm. and jump on them and just like wear the kids out. So by the time the summer rolls around, They've got a group of 10 to 12 kids that are really, really good committed to him, like the Kelly kid. If they could hold on to him, because I, I'm telling you, he, he he was really good last year. And I was like, all right, they're taking him early. This is a kid that's an SEC caliber kid. You want to talk about they they got a potential five star DN there. So, you know, they already have the kid from Georgia committed to him. That's a huge FSU fan. They got to put their hooks in these guys early and just wear them out because that's, that's what Miami's done a great job of. They just wore these kids out. I mean, Miami came off a six and seven season and they sold the hell out of that school and Florida state's got to do the same thing. It's still, listen, I told somebody the other day, yeah, they won only two games this year, three games. It's still Florida state. Let, let like, we could say the facilities aren't that good. You could come up with the, it's still a better school than 90% of the other schools out there. And the facilities are still better than Miami's. Exactly. You know, so you could, you could make the excuses, but enough's enough. Like they got to go out and just, Hey, listen, you're, you were dealt a bad hand. There's people that still win hands of poker with a terrible hand. Like you got to go out and make it happen. And they're going to have to do that. And, and, and the thing that, that you're talking about in terms of early offers, the, the, re the thing that really matters there is you have to, you have to nail your early evaluations. Huh. They've got to decide who are the guys that we are going to go all out for on our early offers? And you better be right. Yeah. And, and, well, and so to me, Marvin Jones is, is, I'm telling you right now, Marvin Jones, the Kelly kid, th those are no brain. They're obvious. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, the thing is, like you said, there's, there's six, what, five, six, seven layups that automatically, I mean, you could say there's probably seven guys that should be in, in the 2022 class. If they just, if they just take care of their business at all, that would be the best player in this, in this year's class. Yeah, no question. And so, you know, at that point, take care of business, get, you know, show some progress on the field so that some of those, some of those elite guys, cause you know, you get an Armella kind of guy, if they show some progress, they're going to get that kid. And, you know, the same thing with, with Marvin Jones. I mean, those guys are guys that you, you cut them and you know what color they bleed but they're not going to go somewhere to lose. No. They're not going to go somewhere to be coached by guys they don't trust. So if they, but if they see progress, th then you're going to get those guys. So show some progress and then you get those guys and those guys can help recruit some of the other guys. And you get that momentum building to me, this next recruiting class, the 2022 recruiting class is the, 
that's when we're going to know really whether Mike Norvell and his staff are going to, are going to have a good shot at turning this around. Oh, if, 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 if they, it's not a, the 2020, yeah, the 2022 class makes or break them as far as I'm concerned, because there's so many, it's, there's elite level kids that are difference makers. And those are the guys at the end of the day, coaching's great. Scheme's great. You need the players, we, you know, guys. And again, they're not just difference makers. They're guys that they should get. Yeah. That, that, that you are institutionally positioned to get. So 2022 is going to tell, tell us a lot. They need to be top two in the ACC and, you know, top eight or so nationally in the 2022 class. I don't think that there's a whole lot of, a whole lot of excuses left if that's not the case. And if they do that, then this class can actually bolstered by that some of these other guys can help be floor setters while those guys are starting to set the ceiling. And then you're starting to build the program. If you don't do that, then this, and you're depending on these, on this year's guys to be the backbone of the program and to, to set that ceiling, it, it's, it's going to be a, a, a tough few years. So, you know, I think there are players who can contribute in this class, several of them. And, and I, I I'm, it's interesting to watch their, their philosophy on how they didn't take a single kid that, that is a bigger you know, it's carrying some carrying extra weight on him this year. All the guys that they're looking at on the on, on the offensive and defensive lines are guys that, if anything, need to add a little bit of weight. And you can see that that's what they believe. That's what they believe in. That 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 tells me something about this staff. They believe in getting at guys that are kind of slimmer, more athletic, and trying to add weight to them. And that can work, but you better be able to do it. Well, the one thing with a recruiting class like this, and I try to tell people this, because you hear it all the time about, hey, star rankings, star rankings. There's less room for error with the three star than there is a five star. I know people want to say, oh, yeah, we, we, we don't need five stars. Listen, you could take a bunch of three stars, but understand there's more room for error. There's less chance that they're going to become great than somebody that has the potential to be great. But um, Jason, listen, man, I really appreciate you coming on. How, how would uh, people that are that want to follow you and listen to you, what are some of the ways that they could, um, you know, join the Jason Staples fan club? Uh, best way is uh, to, to subscribe and listen to the unconquered podcast. Uh, I've, I've also got a, a Patreon page where I'm doing some uh, X's and O's breakdowns uh, over there. Uh, and, you know, I'll answer some questions there periodically, but uh, that's at uh, patreon.com slash unconquered podcast. And also over at Twitter, where I generally am uh, causing some sort of trouble at different points at, uh, at doc staples. Hey, he's but, a- hey, I've had to warn you a couple of times. I mean, Hey, you, Hey, Corey, you know, when I have to tell you to back down, I've had to call Jason a couple of times. I'm like, damn, man, you, you may have went too far for me. I, I, I keep my ether life. hand. <laughs> I stand clear. When, when Jason's on the war path, I stand clear. <laughs> like, I, you know, I, don't, I don't want that smoke. Yeah. He's like, man, I keep my ether he goes, handy, man. Fish is giving me more advice. Wait a second. You saw that wrong. <laughs> that, that's, that's when I know yeah. I got to go delete that one. Oh, man. Oh, man. But hey, listen, this was great. I really appreciate it. I know you're busy with a lot of stuff. And hey, I, I'd like to get you back on again. And only one t- time I could come on your uh, one man show there, you know. But uh, yep, I'd be great. happy to have you on. It was great talking to you, Jason. You have a great night, man. Appreciate it, Fish. Thanks, man. Bye.